Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and call the uh, Stanley County Board of Commissioners regular meeting to order uh, for March 19th. Uh, good evening. Welcome, uh, everyone that is here this evening. Uh, if you will, uh, join uh, Vice Chairman uh, McIntyre in our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, this devotion uh, tonight will be a little different uh, than times past and what we usually do. Um, I'd like to read something for you tonight uh, entitled, Did You Know, sent to me by a good friend of mine, and it just said to me uh, kind of where our country is today, and I thought maybe it'd be appropriate to do, read this tonight. As I read this, if you wish to do so, feel free to bow uh, as in prayer, or if you don't desire, then that's fine too, but I'd like to read this for you this time. Did you know as you walk up the steps to the building which houses the U.S. Supreme Court, you can see near the top of the building a row of the world's lawgivers, and each one is facing one in the middle, who is facing forward with a full frontal view. It is Moses, and he is holding the Ten Commandments. Did you know as you enter the Supreme Court courtroom, the two huge oak doors have the Ten Commandments engraved on each lower portion of each door? Did you know, as you sit inside the courtroom, you can see the wall right above where the Supreme Court judges sit, a display of the Ten Commandments? Did you know there are Bible verses etched in stone all over the federal buildings and monuments in Washington, D.C.? Did you know James Madison, the fourth president, known as the father of our Constitution, made the following statement? We have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Did you know every session of Congress begins with a prayer by a paid preacher whose salary has been paid by the taxpayers since 1777? Did you know 52 of the 55 founders of the Constitution were members of the established Orthodox churches in the colonies? Did you know Thomas Jefferson worried that the courts would overstep their authority and instead of interpreting the law, would begin making law an oligarchy, the rule of few over many? How then have we gotten to the point that everything we have done for 220 years in this country is now suddenly wrong? and unconstitutional. Let's put this around the world and let the world see and remember what this great country was built on, the Holy Bible and belief in God. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Vice Chairman McIntyre. Appreciate that. Uh, everyone has the agenda uh, in front of you. Is there any adjustments, or do I have an approval of the agenda? <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Eford. I'll make a motion we approve as presented, sir. I got, got a motion from Commissioner Eford, second from Vice Chairman McIntyre. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Item one. Retirement Award Presentation, Marla Lukash. Marla Lukash began working for Stanley County Home Health on January the 5th, 1998, as a public health nurse. Marla is married to Daniel Lukash, and together they have Mike and Jake, daughter-in-law Amanda, and sweet precious granddaughter Addie, who is four years old. In her retirement, she plans to spend more time with her family, especially Addie, as well as enjoying all sorts of crafts, flower and vegetable gardening. Marla has always been a hard worker, taking much pride in her work, showing much compassion for her patients and fellow co co-workers. She has always tried hard to provide the best possible care for her patients and help others any way she can. All her patients loved her and as well as her fellow co-workers. She will be missed greatly. 
but has wish, wished the very best, and she certainly deserves it. Marla, would you join us up front? Thank you, Marla. Uh, item two, Veteran Services Recognition Award. Presenter, Mr. Rod Barbie. I'd like to thank Marla, too. Uh, we uh, grew up together at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. She's not old enough to retire yet. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, all the commissioners. I'll introduce this fellow beside me. This is Mr. Paul Hummel. He's the president of the Stanley County Veterans Council, also the commandant of the Marine Corps League here in Stanley County, and a uh, commander of the local VFW. Well, let me tell you a little something about the Veterans Council. You guys help fund it every year. Not a whole lot of money there. Uh, we, got, we got some citizens in Stanley County to step up and help us fund the things we need to do as far as helping veterans with their power bills or water bills, eviction notice. We got a lot of things that veterans need and the funds are very limited. And tonight we want to come forward and, and I hope this doesn't upset this gentleman or his wife because they've been very instrumental in the last two years of funding events that we have. Yes, we have, we put place flags during Memorial Day and all the veterans Grace and uh, the Veterans Day Parade. But we gotta pay these bills for these veterans and help assist them. And uh, we've got two citizens here in Stanley County that has just helped us out tremendously. He's not aware of this. Uh, in the last two months, I think everybody on the board has been touched by a military funeral here in Stanley County, DMV Chapter 12, okay? They were in dire need of a new bugle system for last rites of the veterans of Stanley County. The funds this gentleman's donated has helped purchase that and it's paid for. This fund, when I, when I took over this position seven years ago, was so low, we couldn't help anybody. But due to public contributions and the board coming to us every year, we're, we're now able to help veterans here in Stanley County and at this time, I'd like to turn this over to Mr. Paul Hummel and let him present an award of recognition. We had two individuals. Unfortunately, one couldn't make it. But uh, I'm going to turn this over to you, Paul. Thank you, Rod. And uh, this award, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the commissioners because without your help and assistance, uh, hey, we wouldn't be a whole lot of ahead of anything. But uh, we appreciate everything you can do with the, with the 
funds that are available. We're going to continue uh, spreading our joy into the community uh, and helping these poor veterans. But when it was brought to my attention that uh, this uh, couple does some extraordinary things, I uh, I said, well, hey, we, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of recognizing and patting on the back. And I kick him in the butt if needed, too. I mean, this is what we do. It's a Marine thing, I know. But uh, and this, I'm going to ask if Chairman McIntyre, would you mind coming down here so we can shake your hand, please? That's Vice Chairman. Oh, Vice Chairman, yes, I'm sorry. Vice oh, there, Chairman. There, there, there's the Chairman over there. Now, this was supposed to be for both. And uh, here's another Marine thing, uh, just so you veterans know. Uh, if you're on time, you're kind of late. That's what we look at. Mr. McIntyre, the Veterans Council, Stanley County, would like to thank you for your continued support to all the veterans of this wonderful county. Sir, this is for you and your wife. I'd like to read this in appreciation for Gene and Sue McIntyre. The Veterans Council of Stanley County would like to thank you for your continu uh, continued support for all the veterans of the county. And that's heartfelt. And I thank you, brother. Thank you. And it's heartfelt right here, too. I appreciate it. As long as you just took the alarm out of this thing. There's no alarm. There's, no alarm. There's, There's, There's a small there. camera around okay, here. The camera around here. Thank you. And I'm sorry my wife couldn't make it. Well, if she was not feeling well, we yeah. wish her the best. So thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, back. Hang on, don't y'all run off. We want to get down there. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Come on great, down. Great, great. great. Come on in here. Yeah. So I can take my specs off <laughs> Come on over here. Come on over here. Down there, the army over there. Hey, Scoot in just a little bit. Scoot in just a little bit. Thank you very much. He's a friend of Caroline Blue Jacket. Thank you very much. I just like to say one thing. It doesn't take much. I mean, we've given some money over the past couple of years. Uh, we've chosen some charities. Uh, this is uh, one of our number one charities. Uh, I never had to serve in the, in the service, but my father-in-law did, and I know a lot of people did. And we just want to help our veterans all we can. So thank you for this. Uh, we didn't do it for recognition. We just did it for I know you did. I know you did. So no, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, you. you guys have a great night. Right. Good to see you. Good again. Same here. Same here. Same here. Same here. Same here. Same Behave yourself. Thank okay. You. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. He's mixed up. Right. You're the chair. Yes, sir. He's the vice chair. Yes, sir. No, no, that's okay. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. We got it. Hey, we got to go. Okay. Thank you. That'll be FW me. Thank you all. Here. You're all set. Well, I mean, you don't. <laughs> All right, item three, proclamation declaring April 2018 as Child Ab Abuse Prevention Month. Miss Dolly Clayton. <laughs> Started my morning out with Dolly, so I'm going to finish. finish That's right. Out. Take a more good evening. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to be before you today um, to request um, that you um, do this resolution proclaiming April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. I am pleased to say that the um, Consolidated Human Services Board um, has already uh, passed this resolution, um, and so I'm hoping that you will do the same. Um, uh, recognizing um, that children are our most valuable asset and therefore we want to do everything we can in our community to protect them. Um, and so I will read through the proclamation. Resolution proclaiming April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. 
whereas children are vital to our state's future success, prosperity, and quality of life, as well as being our most vulnerable assets, and whereas all children deserve to have the safe, stable, nurturing homes and communities that they need to foster their healthy growth and development, and whereas child abuse and neglect are a community responsibility affecting both the current and future quality of life of the community, and whereas communities that provide parents with the social support, knowledge of parenting, and child development and concrete resources they need to cope with stress and nurture their children, ensure that all children grow to their full potential, and whereas effective child abuse prevention strategies succeed because of partnerships created among citizens, human service agencies, schools, faith communities, healthcare providers, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community, and now therefore we, the Stanley County Board of Commissioners to hereby proclaim the month of April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention Month and call upon all citizens, community agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders and businesses to increase their participation in our effort to support families, thereby preventing child abuse and neglect and strengthening the communities in which we live. So I hope that you will pass this resolution. Thank you, Dolly. Any questions or anything, Ms. Clayton? Commissioner Lawhon. I would like to uh, make a motion that we accept the uh, proclamation in April 2018 child abuse. Got a motion by Commissioner Lawhon, second by Commissioner Morgan. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you so much. And just um, before I leave the podium, I would like to say um, on April the 10th at 5 15, um, the, the work of the Butterfly House will be supported by Walk Away Child Abuse. Um, and so they're going to do a walk um, and a balloon release in honor of children. Um, and so I will provide this information uh, to Ms. Brummett. Um, and then also on uh, Friday, April the 27th, um, they're going to have a breakfast buffet uh, for um, it's called the child abuse and prevention and awareness breakfast and so if you're available I hope that you will uh, support these causes and um, support um, the work we're doing as we increase awareness of child abuse um, in our community and so that we can do um, as much prevention effort as possible thank you very much Dolly <coughs> all right item four <coughs> 911 public hearing to consider renaming Barnwood Lane presenter Andy Lucas. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. And um, I'm actually going to take this item uh, due to the loss of one of our employees uh, um, this weekend. Uh, Karen is uh, attending um, services, and so uh, she sends her regrets. Um, but I know you all will understand. Um, we have uh, before you this evening a uh, public hearing uh, and a request for naming a private road uh, off of uh, off of Silver Road, um, and the, the reason for that is there's so many there's now A, B, and C, and D, and it becomes very difficult for law enforcement in trying to respond when you have all those uh, letters for uh, those roads. And so, just uh, given the the volume of um, homes and other uh, structures that are, are going on um, off of Silver are asking for it to be uh, renamed and they're recommending uh, Barnwood Lane based on the process they've gone through uh, which is fairly comprehensive uh, to to get uh, names and rec rec recommendations uh, from the uh, adjacent landowners so um, I'll be happy to answer any questions but the board will need to hold a public hearing and then uh, take action that uh, you choose any uh, questions from board members for uh, mr. Lucas Seeing none, I will uh, declare the public hearing open. Is there anyone here wishing to speak for or against the renaming or, or the naming of Barnwood Lane? Anyone here wishing to speak for or against this? Seeing none, I will declare the public hearing closed. Uh, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Swain. I move to accept the recommendation of the 911 director to name the current private drive to Barnwood Lane. I've got a motion uh, to move forward uh, with the, naming the private drive of Barnwood Lane. I have a second. Second, second by Commissioner Morgan. 
any further uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Motion carries 7 0. All right, item five Stanley County Schools capacity, demographics, trends, school choices, and taxes to fund education. Presenter Peter Shudo. I want to thank y'all for having me. Now I just got to figure out where to. Oh, down here. Now, how do I get the... Oh, here we go. Just click that to move your thing. Okay, just click it once and it goes. Click it once and it goes, and then if you get stuck and you go too fast, you can click this other one and it'll hit. You can, okay. Um, go to On the job out. training, man. Thank y'all. <laughs> hey, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. And before I start, just want to give a shout out to Alicia Holland and Becky, Becky Broadway, they're, in, they're part of the people in charge of your Stanley County Government Relay for Life team. They called me about a couple weeks ago about doing a 5K or something, so we threw together that Fackenash St. Patrick's Day 5K pie day, and we had pie and ran, and it raised $562 for Stanley County Government's Relay for Life team. So we appreciate y'all doing that. First of all, I just want to thank y'all for, like I said, thank y'all for having me. You know, my reason for being here is, you know, we've had we've talked about schools to death in the last three or four years, and it's going to be budget time. And I'm, this is my first presentation. I'm taking this presentation to all the elected bodies I can get in front of and civic organizations and the Board of Education to kind of give some fact, just basically some facts out there about our schools. You know, and you guys as elected officials, especially especially the county commissioners and the Board of Education, you know, the ones going to have to work together and make decisions to move Stanley County forward. And then I'm going to these other municipalities because at some point, and if they do decide to either, you know, put up another tax referendum or to consolidate schools or build new schools or do whatever they have to do, it's going to take the entire community to get behind it rather than fighting it. They need to just, you know, feel they have these figures out there. People will kind of see. Um, this is basically the slide here, other than since 2001, other than 2004 and 2005, the attendance in Stanley County Schools has declined in 15 of the last 16 years, and we've lost 1,763 students since 2001, 2002. And here's your enrollment levels at the Stanley County Elementary School. They've kind of looked like they've remained pretty much constant over the, since um, 2014. And this is your current Stanley County current elementary school capacity. And I got here the dates from the first of the year in October and then February. I highlighted Oakboro because one thing of interest is that of all, you know, the, the elementary schools, they kind of shuffled their numbers around. They got the same amount of kids. Um, Oakboro lost more kids than any other student. They lost 18, 18 students, you know, from since the first of the year. And now with the total, there's 3,988 elementary school students. And we have room for 5,355 students when you count mobile homes. That's a 75% capacity. When you take out the mobile home, there's 5,055 with 78% capacity. Now I, got a, I posted this today on Facebook and a guy, John Gibson, posted, why do you count the dilapidated trailers in your totals? And here's why I count what he calls dilapidated tra tra mobiles in our totals. The Board of Education has the power to not use mobile units, but they have used mobile units to educate our kids for years. And as long as they're available to use, you have to count them in the capacity totals. You know, and one comment, I think that a lot of times people hate mobile units, but they would rather keep mobile units rather than do the uncomfortable thing of redistricting or closing schools. 
And basically, so I was going to say, technically, we don't have empty desks sitting there. But I'm using that as an analogy. We have capacity in our elementary schools, as they sit right now, for 1,367 more kids. And when, if we take away the mobiles, there's still capacity of 1,076 kids. Now, whoops. Now we go to the middle schools. You go to the enrollment levels of the middle schools, that's pretty consistent. Now, if you look at the totals here, we've had a lot of, there's a lot of space available in the middle schools also. With 1,784 middle school students, you have room for 2,558 with the mobiles and 2,378 with out mobiles. And one thing I want to bring this to everybody's attention, you know, everyone knows that the school board is over budget this year. And a week ago, we had temperatures at 28 degrees in the morning and 45 to 50 degrees at a high. And they had a policy in place to turn the, elect turn the heaters off at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to save utilities. And look at, all the, look at all the empty rooms that they're heating and they're keeping all around, all around the place. Somehow it's skipping. So how did what I do again? Last viewed? There we go. There we go. See, I'm getting the hang of this. So now if you look at the empty desk at the middle school, we have 798 empty desks with mobiles and 714 empty desks in thing that. Now if you go back, the school with the most kids is West Stanley with 561 kids. So we have room for another West Stanley middle school plus extra kids. Okay, let's look at the high schools. The high schools where we took a big hit since we've been taking a big hit. And mind you, when I'm, when I'm talking about this presentation, we also have Stanley Early College and Stanley Academy, but as far as this presentation goes with the capacity, I'm not utilizing these in these four traditional high school numbers. And then if you look at the capacity levels, with 2,100 high school students, we have room for 3,300 more and 2,900 without, with would not use the mobile, mobile units. Look up at Albemarle's numbers if you can. Albemarle has room for 760 kids. And even if you take out the mobile units, they have room for 730 kids. They have 396 kids enrolled at Albemarle High School. You know, I know a lot of times people like to live in the past with their glory days as with Bruce Springsteen said. But at the time, like 12 years ago or 13 years ago, Admiral had almost 700 kids at that school. So they are running at 52 and 54% capacity. That's a lot of empty space. And people notice that they, when they drive down Park Ridge and they see the lack of cars in their parking lot, and people go, man, I remember the day when that place was full. And so in our four high schools, we have room for 1,200 more kids to fit in there. And we only have, I think it's 2,000 elementary school, I mean 2,000 high school kids. So if you look at our 19 traditional high schools, you know, there's 7,953 kids in our 19 traditional schools. And we were just using 70% capacity. We have room for 11,298 kids. I think at our peak we had somewhere over 10,000 kids at, at our peak. Now, if you look at from, from four years ago, if you look at the capacity percentages, in 2014, seven schools were above 80% capacity, and one of them, I believe that was Central, was over 100% capacity. And we had 12 were below 80% capacity. As you see, we're losing students. We have five schools above 80% capacity, and 14 schools are now below 80% capacity. And then the school size, and thank you for calling me, Commissioner Swain, this morning so I could clarify this a little better. This is from the, um, the NCDPI school report cards. It's on the Stanley County Schools website. When you look at, the, look at around the state, everyone says we don't want big schools. We don't want big schools. But if you look at our sizes compared to around the state, at the elementary schools, we average 362 kids. And around the state, there's 493 kids average per school. Middle school, we have average 496 and 634 
is the state average. That's just average. So we're still pretty, all our middle schools are still pretty small. And um, the high school, and got the asterisk there, with the high schools, it says we, we average 425 kids. They add in those numbers, they count total high schools. So the state, they add Stanley Academy's numbers and Stanley Early College numbers, which kind of skews it to a little lower level. But they do the same thing all across the state with every high school. So everyone's high school is skewed a little bit to the lower side. You know, the one thing I looked at that, that stands out to me is on the bottom one with the teachers' levels. In the high school, we average 29, 29 teachers, and there's 54 average in the state. And what I think about when I see that number there is the lack of opportunities that we're able to teach the kids. You know, even if we have, if you take out Stanley Early College, another one, we have more teachers. For high school, still compared to the state, look at all the classes you're not going to be able to offer people. And I know I talked to the new um, superintendent, Dr. James, and he was telling me about how over there in Montgomery County, they, had the, they used the technology where they had a teacher that taught in like West Montgomery and they had the video screen and they taught in East Montgomery. And I remember I, uh, I, I did a presentation for the high school a few years ago, West Stanley, and they had a, one of those classes with, North, with um, Albemarle and they had like 15 kids in one class and 17 kids in the class on the, I mean seven kids on the class. So they had like 22 kids total. And they had the, the, the paid teacher in West Stanley, then they had like a proctor or someone else was in the room at the other school. So in essence, to teach those 22 kids, you're paying for a teacher and another salary just to, you know, rather than having them all in one class. And one thing about the buildings, we get down to buildings, and they always said that the buildings aren't a big cost percentage wise of the schools. You know, I think payroll is like 80% of the school system's budget. But with that payroll, you got to look at efficiencies. And when you're running inefficient payroll by having too many teachers and too small classes, that's where, that's where you really waste a lot of money. One thing that was kind of interesting, I, I counted, and this is pretty close. I can tell you, this is the one slide that's pretty close to being accurate because I had to hand count this stuff and doing the little things. But basically, in the state of North Carolina, there's 384 high schools with football teams. And of those schools with football teams, as far as size, Albemarle is 361 out of 384, South Stanley's 351, North Stanley's 320, and West Stanley's 257 out of 384. And, you know, that's for one county to have all those small schools, you know, shows there. And this is back in the, you know, as you remember, y'all remember when Albemarle won all those football championships, and they didn't do it when they had you know, so few kids. And also one thing that's always, uh, people talk about when you talk about consolidating high schools is the lack of opportunity for kids to play sports because you're combining, you know, you're combining two sports teams, so you're losing some kids. Well, look at what's happened at Albemarle. On the other hand, there's really no, there's no opportunity to girls to play soccer, boys to do golf, or boys to play tennis this spring at all. You know, over the years you see where, um, there's been some schools that can't support a JV team and stuff like that. And also, and this whole thing, and I, and I really don't, I think people don't grasp the knowledge of it when people blame the, the Stanley County school system for losing kids or blaming this one or that one. It's not anybody in particular. It's a whole, a whole lot of factors. And sure, there may be a few people that leave the school system, though they don't like it. But a lot of it is the changes in the delivery of ed education. And if you look at the charter schools, you know, they started in North Carolina with 34 charter schools back in 97, and then they had that limit of 100 charter schools till 2011. And then once they raised that, they went from, they're up to 174 charter schools throughout the state. And there's really no sign of those slowing down. And then the cooperative innovative high school programs, that's your Stanley Early, that's your Stanley Early College programs and, and well, your, yeah, your early college programs and stuff like that. And that's grown. They have 125 of those in the state. Homeschoolers, and we've talked about homeschoolers, and I just put those numbers up there. That's just not a trend that's just in Stanley County. It's, it's all over the place. You know, it's easier to homeschool their kids now. And the other one that's interesting that you're going to see a lot of growth with kids is the 
private school vouchers in North Carolina. Since they started that program, they've they've helped out. Up, it went from 1,200 the first year to 5,700 um, this school year, and that's growing. And another question is, how will new schools in a region impact the Stanley County school system student count? What that means, and when you when you think about our education here, it's not just Stanley County. We have to see what everyone else around us goes. Tillery Charter Academy is going to open in 2019-20. Um, they broke ground for the new high school that's over next to the community college over in Troy. And then, of course, I think Montgomery County Early College is there. I think, Matt, uh, Commissioner, I think you work over there. How many kids do they have over there? Do you know about a couple at, at the Early College? Uh, a couple. They started, and this is the first year. Yeah, we started with two grade levels. Yeah, and then is it going to progress every year? Yes, and then that's almost like what... what Tillery charters doing they're starting with two when they're progressing and you got to ask yourself how are the how are the how how's what Montgomery County students going to impact Stanley County schools we currently have kids from Montgomery County schools coming to Stanley County we have kids from Anson County coming into Stanley County this gives them another choice there are kids from Montgomery County that go to Greystone and what happened is and, and like Montgomery County kids a lot of those kids go to go to both Greystone and when Yawari Charter opened up in Asheboro, some of those kids started going there. And what happens when Montgomery County kids decide not to go to Greystone and maybe try these options, what it does if it leaves more openings for kids from the Stanley County school system to fit into Greystone. And I heard that they had, they had 125 openings at Greystone and they had 250 people um, apply for the apply for them this year in the lottery thing so you know like i said it's really not anyone's fault that this is happening and facilities part of the thing is facilities you know they they had the study the pinnacle architect back in 2015 22 million dollars plus is what they're looking at to bring the schools up to code two comments i want to read out of this thing is that about the elementary schools, one of the comments was the fact is very old elementary school facilities at Baden, Locust, Norwood, and Oakboro exist. The older facilities at these schools are 50 to 100 years old and have outlived their intended use. Okay, high schools. Likewise, the older facilities at Albemarle, North, South, and West are in need of upgrading and replace or replacing. The facilities constructed in the early 60s are also becoming expensive to maintain. You know, then also, I mean, I think with some, I think Commissioner Burleson and Lawhon were too. I mean, we went on that tour of Norwood Elementary School, and they had that open classroom. Well, they fixed that open classroom, and it ended up, um, it cost a million dollars to do that, and they needed to do that for safety reasons and educational reasons. But when you look at that, this is one of the things that just about, about they make those decisions that kind of frustrates you. Because I know as part of Norwood over the years, they have those three buildings. They have the gymatorium, they had the middle classroom, and then they have the original building. And the original building had sewage leaks in it, you know, and that building's still there. And that's one of the older buildings in the, in the county. And they didn't fix that. And then right here, if you look at the pictures of the gymatorium, you have on the one side, you have the new gymnasium that was built in 2009 at Locust. Look at what the kids play on at Locust to play basketball, right? Nice, shiny, nice stands. And that's when we did that, the Rotary Club did that dictionary presentation to third graders. But that is the gymnatorium at Norwood. And look at that, look at that, they have carpet. And if you notice, they're using duct tape to do the out of bounds line. And if you look in the, right above Russ Sharple's head right there against the wall, there's a, basketball rim and can you imagine having your kids practice layups and <laughs> pop into the wall i mean and that was in the report uh yeah they hate those thursday layup practices don't they okay demographics nationally and locally and y'all probably all know the big news toys r us is going out of going out of business and i thought this was interesting i saw this in a washington post article that Toys R Us baby's problem is everybody's problem. 
And um, basically, so, and, and the article was about, yeah, they've had, they have competition issues that's hurt them badly. And they're not blaming the whole thing on demographics, but part of the issue is demographics. And you can look at the birth rates, the US birth rates and sales for Toys R Us, and they have a chart. And as the birth rates go down, the sales at Toys R Us go down, and as the birth rates go up, they go up. And birth rates have fallen steadily, and they hit their lowest point on record in 2016. So, okay, you have less people born in this country in 2016, and you have a government right now that wants to send illegal aliens back over the border and also cut our immigration of legal immigration in half. So where are the people going to come from? They're going to have kids, you know? Yeah. And then this is a projected population. I think you guys saw this. It was in a presentation to you guys. If you look at it, Stanley, and this, this is no different than many of, the, many of the demographic graphs that I saw when I was sitting up there with you guys. Stanley County population is going to grow to six, from 61,000 to 73,000 in 2036. And so that's why you got to, and then you look at the breakdown, it's going to grow mainly with elderly people. Um, you see how it's, it's growing with the 60 plus category. And the schools in 20 years are going to have less than 1,000 kids between growth between 0 to 17 years old, less than, less than 1,000 over a 20 year, a 20 year period. And then that's why sometimes people use figures about housing permits and single family homes. Okay, that's only one part of the equation. What you have to find out, ask yourself, who's moving in there? Are they gonna be the elderly? And are they gonna have kids to go to school when you have this discussion about schools? Cause like I said, part of this is just to hopefully explain to people, it's no one's real fault that we're losing kids in our schools and it's predicted and by the way the guy who did the facility study back in 2000 2015 he has a graph and in the graph it has um, the enrollment trends and for this year he had predicted 2000 i'm, I'm sorry 8135 students and i think he was pretty close within maybe 40 or 50 children and then if you notice, it bottoms out to 2020 to 7,701 students in our thing. And that means a lot more money that's going to not be coming in. So sales tax. Yeah, we're hungry to talk about this one, are we? <laughs> if you look at it, man, we went to the well three times on that. <laughs> you know, and I know we need money for education. It may, be, it may have been other times for that, but it's like in the last, that's what, four years. It's a tough battle to do. To, to get that passed, you really have to work really, really hard to, to get it done. And we, Stanley County has had a history of, you know, not passing um, a sales tax. And then they don't want their property taxes raised either. And then they say they want community schools. And um, that's why, so mainly I just want to bring this to you to put in to how we are. I don't know if y'all have any questions or comments and I appreciate y'all taking the time to do that. And hopefully y'all keep that into consideration. And, 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 I, and last thing I think, I would hope you guys would have a discussion with the school board and sit down and have, have a hard talk with them because it ain't, it ain't going to get any better. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chudo. Any questions from board members? Mr. Chairman, I have one. Uh, Commissioner Swain. Um, did, your, did your numbers account for pre-K? I'm assuming you pulled from I pulled from there. Whatever they, they count, let me look at the, I got the, no, they don't, they don't count, they don't count pre-K in their numbers. They okay. start at the, yeah, because when, anytime you get those ADM things in the total number of kids, they do not count the, the pre-K okay. kids. So that's a, that's a federal allotment, I think, of money the schools receive. And my second, I, I don't know if it's a question more so than a statement. It, I think I don't, I, I don't dispute demographics. I, I don't ever dispute demographics because they are what they are. Um, I, I think I dispute how some current 
House rulings and like House Bill 90, for instance, the, the K, K3 class size, that's going to really affect just by my numbers. It seems just looking at the same data you're looking at. Correct. We're going to have to add 20 classrooms K3 countywide just to meet that mandate over the next four years. Yeah. So, you know, I don't – when we talk about consolidation, I think it's a dangerous game, but – I think we have to take that into consideration and look at those class, actual classrooms, not how many necessar- necessarily the students it can hold. We have to make sure we've got students that that can be there or the, our student counts are correct, I guess. Is correct, what I'm correct, to and that's part of the whole, the, the whole equation. And I, I think that's what's going on in, with your, your high school counts. You know, when you look at those, uh, your teacher counts for high school, I think you have 29 I think some of our teacher counts are off. Well, and that thing it is because, like you said, they have the um, – it's skewed because you only have right. a – you how many do you have at Stanley Academy? Maybe a few, and right. that excuse. I think if you do the, the math number. with but, but like I said, it does – it skews the numbers with every single um, district in the state because they don't just do that for Stanley County. That's right. how they related the numbers. If you just look at our four traditional high schools, I did the math with numbers yeah. you provided, and it comes up to an average of 572. So yes. it – it, you know, it, it it's all in how you look at the. And I, I, I just I just did it right. with the, what came off of there, and that's why I put the thing up. And I'm glad you called to clarify it. Right, and I think that I, you know I would caution that when we look at this, we've got an increasing population of exceptional children that are in low class count counts, and we're going to have to have classrooms to put those in. Well, so, you got like how many thousands you have there to seats to put them in somewhere? Well, you do, but that's based <laughs> off of DPI class allotments and what the school will hold you know if a, if they come to me and say I can only put six kids in this classroom that class capacity becomes six it doesn't become 30. Well you got plenty there to so. do and one, one one thing to consider too and we talked about this and this is just the school board's decision you need to have these tough things I tell you what um, consolidating high schools okay you almost said they to me they almost have to start with the high schools if you close two high schools and combine it into one then you have two high schools which hold a lot of kids with pretty big capacity levels then you could perhaps move the middle schools into the old high schools and then you have the middle schools that you could consolidate the kid i mean there's just a lot of stuff and it's, it's not to go here and to just make things but but there has to be a conversation about that and we'll if they don't want to use mobile home mobile units in this thing, they have the power to to get to get rid of I them. I think our current school board is pretty open to doing away with mobile units, just from a safety standpoint in today's world. Yeah, well, they haven't they haven't mentioned it in the last the last year and a half, so maybe they'll mention it now. Yeah. And then 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 that's why we need to have the that that's why we need to have this conversation, because when they get get kids out of mobile units, and then all of a sudden they have to start sending kids to another school district. They have to be ready to handle that fight because I'm telling you, a lot of people do not want to change. Their, it's just it's, it's not just Stanley County. That's true almost all across the good old U.S. of A. But anyway, any other questions? Any other questions, commissioners? Thank you, commissioner. Thanks. Uh, See you guys. Figure. Uh. Yeah. Uh, item six, consent agenda. What's the uh, pleasure of the board? Move to uh, approve as, as presented. Got a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Second from uh, Commissioner Morgan. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, we are down to public comment. Uh, didn't have anyone sign up. Anyone out there wishing to speak? I would, please. John Edwards from Oakboro. Come on up, John. Good evening, John. Good evening. Um, Chairman, thank you. Uh, Commissioners, thank you for your time and your service. My name is John Edwards. Uh, I have a bit of a raspy voice, so forgive that. Um, uh, as many of you guys know, I am a candidate 
for school board. Uh, Mr. Shudo has given us some, uh, you yeah, know, I was just taking notes. I'm trying to read them here as he was going through. And, uh, and I can appreciate his information. I can appreciate him and his concern and passion for our schools. Um, <clears throat> however, I can tell you that myself and, and many of you would know uh, Anthony Graves, who's also running for school board. He couldn't be here tonight. There's probably not two people, two people in the county that has spent as much time as we have covering this exact data that you heard about tonight. And um, for example, you hit the nail on the head with the state mandates coming. You can't count doorways and say 30 kids, 30 kids, 30 kids, 30 kids. It doesn't work like that. The state's not going to allow it. Um, what does matter is, con is uh, <clears throat> contents and perspective. So with that said, what I wanted to ask you guys tonight is to reserve judgment on what you've heard here and allow me and Mr. Graves to come and present the same data, but with the correct context and perspective. And I'll give you a quick example of why that matters. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Shudo pointed out that Oakboro had lost 18 kids this year. But what you don't realize or may not know about Oakboro is Oakboro is a choice STEM school. It's not a districted school which means a couple of things when it comes to enrollment. Number one, it means that we don't have a district. So if a kid or a family moves to Oak Bird during the middle of the school year, they're not allowed to come to Oak Bird School. It's not even an option. If they live inside of the city limits of Oak Bird, they would be they would go to Aquadale. If they live in the Oak Bird proper uh, on the other side, they would go to Stanfield. So that's not an option to bring a kid in. Second, <coughs> Oak Bird being a choice STEM, works both ways. Oak Burr has a choice. We have kids at Oak Burr with many, many absentees. They're sent back to their district. We have kids with discipline problems. They're sent back to their districts. And that's the way that school was set up. So that can maybe explain why some of their loss and none of their gain. Uh, <clears throat> also, while I appreciate the information, the um, demographer report that he spoke about, and I remember that well, and he said we bottomed out. Well, what he didn't tell you is after we bottom out for the next five years, we have a steady gain of students by the same demographer. So there again. And then the last page of his report also clearly shows that we gain roughly 1,000 students in the county over the next 15 years also. So you know, what I would ask is you reserve judgment that we will put in a request in short order to bring this data to you in what we believe is a correct context and a better perspective, and then you draw your conclusions from that. So thank you for your time, and, and Peter, thank you for, for what you do also. Thank you. Thank you, John. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak? Uh, anyone else? Seeing none. All right, board comments. Uh, start at this end, uh, Commissioner Morgan, comments? Uh, first off, I'd just like to offer my condolences to the Eford family uh, on behalf of all of us here. Um, and uh, also for the public who doesn't know, a lot of uh, a couple of us commissioners were able to go to the White House this uh, last week. Uh, we were invited up there uh, for a meeting, um, which I think it was an honor to be up there, to be honest. And then also uh, it was a great learning experience. Um, how the White House is hopefully wanting to work uh, better with local governments. Um, so hopefully in the future we'll, we'll see how that pans out, but it seems to be on the right track. Uh, Commissioner Lahan. I do have a couple things, Mr. Chairman. Um, speaking on the same line of what uh, Commissioner Morgan stated, we heard some great speakers and some information that was released while we were in Washington. Uh, one in particular, and I think these numbers probably have been out there, but we're not hearing what's really happening in Washington through the mainstream media. But one statement that was made was there were 2.3 million jobs added since January of 2017, which is big. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson was there, who was the HUD secretary, and he made the statement about how to reduce 
potential of becoming a person of poverty. And he talked about things that you can do to prevent that. And I thought this was interesting. He stated that to stay out of, uh, the, keep your chances of being in poverty uh, less, to, matter of fact, 2%, you need to finish high school. And I think this is good advice for any citizen. You need to get married. You need to wait until you're married to have a child. And if you do those things, uh, it reduces the possibility down to 2% of you becoming a person of poverty. And he should know because he's in the charge of the HUD, which I thought was very interesting. The other fact that I want to talk about is uh, Mark Short, who's assistant to the president, director of internal affairs, he talked about items that uh, have happened since the tax relief. And I knew a lot of companies have given bonuses and or raises or both, but last week he stated that 452 companies have given bonuses and pay increases since the tax plan passed, which I thought was very interesting. And he did make the statement, we don't think that's crumbs. And <laughs> some politicians do. I think it's great that that has taken place. And the last thing I want to talk about doesn't have anything to do with the Washington trip, but it has to do with uh, the Central Line of Council of Government. There's a regional conference entitled Creative Solutions for Thriving Communities. It's on Thursday, April the 12th, from uh, registration somewhere about 8.30, but it runs till about 4 o'clock. It can be held at the Harris Conference Center uh, on Harris Campus Drive in Charlotte. I would encourage any commissioner that can take that day to go to this conference. I can tell you that the city of Albemarle, some of the council members, plus some of the staff will be attending, and I would encourage some of our administration and any commissioner to please go to this because we need to hear all we can hear about being a thriving community. And it takes more than just one city. It takes towns, it takes city, it takes the county. So let me encourage you to attend. I have sign up brochure. I think Tyler can register us if we decide to go spend a day in Charlotte to hear this information. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lahan. Uh, Commissioner Louder. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Eford. Just one quick one, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senior Advisory Committee had a meeting last week, and uh, we should be hearing something from the feasibility study that this board approved. Uh, maybe Andy might have some more information on that, but hopefully we will hear that in April. So uh, just want you to be aware of that. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Swain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had one comment. Uh, my takeaway from the, the meeting uh, at the White House this past week was the, the push for infrastructure. Uh, typically, when infrastructure money comes down from the federal government, it comes down to your state government, and then it gets divvied out however they see fit by some random formula that is generated somewhere that typically favors large municipalities such as Charlotte, Wake County, um, Raleigh. Uh, those the, the legislation that they're trying to push down uh, is would earmark of large percentage of that for rural communities. So the state would not have an option but to push that, that money out to our rural communities for infrastructure, which is what, what we work so hard to upgrade in some areas and add initially in others. And I, I think that was, a big, that was a big benefit that I saw. So I encourage all of us to, to keep talking to Congressman Hudson and our Senate delegation to to encourage that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Swain. Vice Chairman McIntyre. I'd just like to once again thank uh, the Veterans Association for what they did tonight. And as I said, we didn't do it for the recognition. We did it because uh, we believe in it. And uh, on behalf of uh, Sue and myself, I want to thank them. And uh, you guys keep a good secret, don't you? Thank you, Vice Chairman McIntyre. Um, 
I, like uh, Commissioner Morgan, would just offer condolences to um, the Eford family and uh, please uh, everyone keep your keep uh, those folks in your prayers and uh, all of our public safety folks uh, uh, losing one of their own. Um, also, like to thank Vice Chairman McIntyre for all your service. That was a, a nice award to receive, and uh, Commissioner, Mr. McIntyre has always been a true statesman and uh, going above and beyond uh, for Stanley County. So thank you. Uh, just remind everyone we've got a note in here. Uh, I know we've got another meeting in between, but uh, just keep in mind on your uh, uh, put on your calendar Monday, April 16th at 4:30. We've got a joint meeting with the Library Board of Trustees. Um, and our next scheduled meeting is Monday, April 2nd at 6 p.m. And that's all we've got. What is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Eford. I would happily make a motion we adjourn, sir. Got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Vice Chairman McIntyre. All those in favor, stand up. <laughs>